Well, greetings, sisters, and happy Women's History Month. March is Women's History Month, and we celebrate all those who have defied the odds and blazed the trail for women today. Our theme this month is Remarkable Women Defying the Odds. Tonight, our guest is Evangelist Frida Morrison. She will share her remarkable story and journey of her becoming the first female president of the International Pentecostal Young People's Union of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. And we're just looking forward to her sharing in just a little while. At this time, we'll go forth in prayer. God, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for all that you are in our lives. We thank you for blessing us to come together one more time, oh God, to share and just to encourage each other. We thank you for the community of women. Thank you for the homes, God, that are represented here. We thank you for Evangelist uh, Morrison. We ask that you continue to bless her, strengthen her, Lord, in every area of her life, her and her family. And God, that everything that you have for her to do, we thank you, Lord, that that will be completed in Jesus' name. Oh, God, we pray for those that are sick right now, those that are shut in, those in the hospitals, those, God, that are just bound and need to be set free. We ask that you bring deliverance in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for peace that surpasses all understanding. Oh, God, those that may be bound even in their mind, Father, we know that you are the Prince of Peace. We know that your mind regulator, so as you regulate the mind now in the name of Jesus, heal from all matter of diseases, from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet. Make ways out of no ways, God. We thank you for being a miracle working God. We thank you for being a provider. We thank you for being a supplier. We thank you for being everything that we need. We know it's all in you. We ask God that you bless our segment on tonight. Strengthen, motivate, inspire women to go forth in their purposes that you place in them to do. We decree it done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our scripture tonight is from Deuteronomy 31 and 6, King James Version. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And that's the King James Version. Thank the Lord that his word and the people that I obey his word are blessed as well. At this time, we will give a short presentation of the top 10 first of Black women in history. We know this is Women's History Month, and we are really trying to, uh, to, um, to do that. Let's see. Hold on just a second. There's something wrong. Mm, there's something wrong. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Go back to... So. All right, so in again. Hello and welcome back. In this Black Excellence presentation, we will highlight 10 Black women trailblazers. Welcome to BlackExcellence.com, the site where we share Black excellence, opulence, and affluence. Our mission is to inspire you as we enlighten you. We here at Black Excellence specialize in illuminating the experience and contributions of African Americans, which is the foundation of our channel. It is also essential for the Black community, as well as white America, to understand the impact of Black women pioneers, entrepreneurs, and inventors from our past. These women are rarely given the credit that they deserve in terms of their accomplishments in the face of incredible resilience, perseverance, and discrimination. These women didn't have to be given seats at the table. They built and brought their own. Our aspiring grade school student will not read much about these women in the history books, so we hope you take the time to celebrate these trailblazers who may inspire them and help propel their dreams forward. In this original Black Excellence video, we will be featuring 10 African American women who were the first in their field. They excelled in fields that were not only off limits to African Americans, but even more restricted to African American women. So without further ado, let's get started. Number 1. Phyllis Wheatley Phyllis Wheatley was the first African American poet to publish a book. Born in 1753, she was brought to New England from West Africa as a slave when she was nearly eight years old. 
the Wheatley family purchased and named the young girl, and after discovering her passion for writing, they caught her writing with chalk on the wall, tutored her in reading and writing. She studied English literature, Latin, Greek, and the Bible. With the family's help, Phyllis Wheatley traveled to London in 1773 and published her first poems. Soon after, when she returned to America, she was granted her free there's a better way to make money on Amazon than selling physical products. Three years ago, I quit my job and using this exact freedom. Number two, Mary Jane Patterson. Mary Jane Patterson was 16 years old when her family, among others, moved to Ohio in hopes of sending their children to college. The daughter of a master mason, Patterson became the first black woman to graduate from an established American college, Oberlin College. Three years after completing her studies in 1862, Patterson was appointed a teacher assistant in the female department of the Institute of Colored Youth in Philadelphia, according to the African American Registry. She later taught at the Preparatory High School for Colored Youth, renamed Dunbar High School, serving as the school's first black principal from 1871 to 1874. Number three, Mary Eliza Mahoney. Mary Eliza Mahoney, born in 1845, had been a cook, a janitor, and a washerwoman before she began working at the New England Hospital for Women and Children, according to Jacksonville University. When she was 33, she entered the hospital's 16-month nursing program and earned her certification. In a 40-year career, Mahoney directed the Howard Orphan Asylum in Long Island, New York, and was a founding member of the group that became the American Nurses Association. After retirement, Mahoney continued to fight for minority rights, and in 1920, became one of the first women to register to vote in Boston. Number four, Maggie Lena Walker. Maggie Lena Walker, the daughter of a former slave, went to public schools in Richmond, Virginia, became a teacher, and established a newspaper before founding the St. Luke Penny Savings Bank in 1903, according to the National Park Service. In chartering the bank and serving as its first president, Walker broke gender and racial barriers. She later served as board chairwoman when the bank merged with two other Richmond banks, the Park Service reports. The resulting entity until 2009 was recognized as the nation's oldest continually African-American operated bank. Number five, Claudette Cloven. Claudette Cloven broke ground nearly 10 months before Rosa Parks. In March 1955, Cloven, then just 15 years old, was arrested for violating an ordinance in Montgomery, Alabama that required segregation on city buses, according to a Stanford University entry. Cloven went to jail without a chance to call her family, a University of Idaho researcher wrote. Cloven and other women challenged the law in court, but black civil rights leaders, pointing to circumstances in Cloven's personal life, thought Parks would make a better icon for the movement. Being dragged off that bus was worth it just to see Barack Obama become president, Cloven said in the 2017 book, Still I Rise. So many others gave their lives and didn't get to see it, and I thank God for letting me see it. Number six, Alice Dunnigan. Alice Dunnigan was mostly ignored during White House news conferences until John F. Kennedy became president. That's when Jet Magazine in 1961 ran the headline, Kennedy in, Negro Reporter Gets First Answer in Two Years, according to the Pointer Institute, a journalism school and think tank. Dunnigan, born in 1906 in rural Kentucky, was the daughter of a tenant farmer and a laundress. She began pinning columns at just 13 years old. She graduated from Kentucky State University and taught for 18 years before moving to Washington. In 1947, she became chief of the Associated Negro Press and the first African-American woman accredited to cover the White House, according to the Kentucky Commission on Women Foundation. Number seven, Alice Coachman. Alice Coachman changed that by soaring an unprecedented five feet, six and one eighth inches in the high jump at the London Games. She also jumped into the history books as the first black woman to win an Olympic gold medal. The Albany State Georgia College student surpassed the Olympic record of five feet, four and three fourths inches 
held jointly by Americans Jean Shiley and Babe Digrickson since the 1932 Olympics. Close to 82,000 spectators watched Coachman's August 7, 1948 victory that came in dramatic fashion as she competed against Dorothy Tyler of Great Britain. Both women jumped the same height, but the American was given the nod because Tyler had several misses at lower heights. Number 8. Ruby Bridges Ruby Bridges became a civil rights activist when she was only six years old. Although the Supreme Court ruled against segregation in public schools in the Brown versus Board of Education decision, many all-white schools in the South were still not completely on board with welcoming black students. Bridges passed the entrance exam to attend an all-white elementary school, William France Elementary School, in her New Orleans neighborhood. And in 1960, she became the first African-American child to desegregate the all-white elementary school in the South. Federal marshals escorted Bridges and her mother past angry protesters each day. Bridges wrote two books about her experiences and received the Carter G. Woodson Book Award. Number 9. Mae Jemison Mae Jemison began studying at Stanford University when she was just 16 years old. She earned a degree in chemical engineering and in 1981 a doctorate in medicine from Cornell University. Jemison was chosen for NASA's astronaut program in 1987 and became the first black woman to travel in space in 1992 after launching with the Space Shuttle Endeavour crew. Afraid of heights, she nevertheless logged 190 hours, 30 minutes, 23 seconds in space, NASA said. Number 10. Vernice Armour Known simply as Fly Girl, Vernice Fly Girl Armour went from beat cop to combat pilot in three years. Within months of earning her wings, she found herself flying over the deserts of Iraq, supporting the men and women on the ground. After serving two tours overseas, she had become America's first African-American female combat pilot. After returning home, she realized that many people wanted to create breakthroughs in their own lives. They just didn't know how. From her experiences, she created a seven-step process called the Zero to Breakthrough TM Success Plan. She now travels extensively, sharing this message through her keynotes, coaching, and seminars. She is your battle-tested speaker and ignites audiences with a dynamic spark that can't be extinguished. Lead your team through the execution of any plan by harnessing the power of a breakthrough mentality. From the moment she leaps into the audience, she shows attendees how to go from zero to breakthrough and create a personal flight plan utilizing her candid strategies to win on the battlefield of business and life. We appreciate the fact that you stayed with us until the end. Thank you for spending time with us and don't forget to like this video. Also. Oh my God, there was great information that was shared there. And you just never knew, uh, you know, how many people that were the first uh, of their kind. And we just thank the Lord for that video. So if you ever want to go out and look at even more videos, that's Exilist, I believe it's uh, Exilist um, on YouTube. Just look up Exilist Women's First or something like that on YouTube. And I'll, I'll also share that in the replay information. I'll put that link in the replay. So you can always go back there and look at more uh, of those videos from that YouTube channel. A lot of great information. And as we go through the month, I'll be sharing information as well, sharing some of the other women's stories. Uh, the first are even uh, women that have uh, blazed a trail uh, for women today. It's always good to look back in history and know uh, where you know our journey came from. And even those that are making a legacy now you know, for the women that's coming behind us. So it's always good to know that that's where the inspiration comes from. A lot of times from that history, and we can look in the Bible and see all the inspiration from the women, uh, those that were the first uh, that was that went forth in certain things in, in the Bible. So we have a lot of history we can look at so that we can be inspired, empowered, and we can go forth in what God has called us to do. So at this time, we're going to introduce our awesome guest that is a trailblazer herself. I tell you what, I'm just honored to have her with us tonight, this powerful woman of God, anointed, innovative, gifted, 
and talented are just some of the terms used to describe evangelist Frida Morrison, who recently broke the glass ceiling as the first female president of the International Pentecostal Young People's Union in its 85th plus year history. With a fresh approach to ministry that crosses denominational, cultural, and socioeconomic lines, this young woman has made a lasting impact in youth ministry on the local, state, and international levels. As a licensed evangelist with Pentecostal Assemblies of the World Incorporated, Frida has traveled across the world evangelizing and preaching the gospel and that she does in various areas, including Canada, Mexico, Europe, Asia, and Central America. Frida is a lifelong member of the Pentecostal Faith Assembly Church, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, pastored by her mother, Suffragan Bishop Brenda Culbertson. She also serves in ministry with her husband, Derek Markson. Together, they enjoy serving the people of God through ministry and through music. Oh, it's such a pleasure to have her on here tonight. Can't wait till she shares. She's doing an awesome work, and not only in the PFW, but she does it cross uh, you know, cross uh, culture and, and uh, special socioeconomic places, as she has said. <laughs> I'm just so honored to have you on here tonight. So at this time, we sit attentively as she shares her journey, her story, and her journey with us. We will come back in for dialogue. Trailblazer. Oh, my God. A woman first. Amen. President. So we'll give away now to evangelist Frida Morrison. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, wow, praise the Lord, everyone. I am just so honored and excited to be with you all tonight. Um, first of all, giving honor to God and to uh, Evangelist Morrison. This is Morrison and Morrison night tonight. I know it, that's right. That's my cousin, y'all. Morrison my times cousin. two. <laughs> so we family, we are family tonight. Um, but I'm just so honored and thankful for the invitation just to share uh, my story and my journey. Um, I'm, you know, even though I'm near the end of, of my term as president of the IPYPU, I am still in awe of just how amazing God has been to me. And just the fact that um, I'm here, um, you know, and I'm, I'm going to get into my, my story very, very quickly, but um, uh, I see some people that I, some faces I know, some faces I don't know, but I just want to greet all of you in the precious name of Jesus, whoever you are, um, praise the Lord. Amen. Um, I'm from Philadelphia as, as it was stated in the bio and, you know, I'm just kind of a, a laid back person. I just want to be able to share my journey with you in an authentic way, just be myself. And, um, I hope that it's a blessing to, to you because, um, the fact that we are all able to uh, have the opportunity to testify and to share our stories with each other is a wonderful opportunity. Somebody can gain something that can help them on their journey. And one thing that I've learned, uh, even though I'm considered one of the young people and I'm starting to edge on out, um, I've had both young and old uh, people in my life that have been a blessing to me and I've had both young and old share that I've been a blessing to them. So at the end of the day, you're never too young and you're never too old to be a blessing to somebody. You know, when I think about my journey, my journey starts with a woman, a woman by the name of Pastor Helen Campbell. Pastor Helen Campbell was my great grandmother. She was born in the year 1900 in a town called Sutherland, Virginia, which is right outside of Danville. Um, and she was a part of a family that was one of the first families that received the revelation of the, baptiz of the baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost in the early 1900s. I am a fifth generation apostolic. So not only was my great grandmother saved, but my great great grandparents were saved my great grandparents, my grandparents and my mother and my father, of course, and then down to me. So five generations of 
this gospel in our family. And so I have a large family with very strong apostolic roots. But Pastor Helen Campbell, um, she was born in the year 1900 and she was my first pastor. She, um, I was born in 1980. So that means if she was born in 1900, she was 80 years old when I was born. I have no physical memory. I have no physical memory of ever hearing my first pastor preach. Um, and she passed away in 93. So I was, I was a teenager, just hitting my teenage years when she passed away. I have no physical memory of ever hearing my pastor preach. Um, at that point in her ministry, she had been preaching since 1928. And so by the time 1980 came along, at that point, she was utilizing a lot of our associate ministers. We had a lot of, of missionaries that would come through and preach. Um, and so although I had, I didn't have a physical memory of hearing her preach on a Sunday morning, she kept her Bible study. She taught Bible study and she always gave remarks on Sunday. So I consider myself and a lot of, of young people in my generation that grew up at my church, we all consider our, ourselves products of her teaching and her life, even though we never heard her preach a Sunday morning sermon. Um, her life was such a, a, a great example to us. She was such a powerful woman of God. Many sons and daughters were birthed through her ministry, um, pastors and bishops, and just she was just an awesome, awesome woman of God. And, you know, she was the first person that really recognized leadership in a way that I was able to grasp. As a child coming up in church, I was a pew baby. And, and I'll talk about my mother in, in just a moment, but I grew up in church as a pew baby. And, you know, that's that's all I knew was, was being in church and having a family that was in church. And so I grew up at a time where, you know, it seemed like all of the young people were involved in ministry. And it's kind of different now. You know, I was talking with one of my friends earlier this week and uh, we were kind of laughing because, you know, I started leading and having an official leadership role at my church when I was eight years old. The Lord filled me with the Holy Ghost. I was baptized at the age of seven and I started a, a ministry, literally started a ministry when I was eight years old and it was called WCDI. We can do it. And um, this ministry started, it was kind of funny. Um, we used to, you know, back in the day, we had second service or afternoon service as they call it every Sunday. It didn't have to be anything special. We always had multiple services on a Sunday. And so after morning worship, we always uh, had a, a time of fellowship and we would eat. You know how it is, we like to eat in the church. So we would, we would eat and so, um, you know, all of the adults would always have the basics, the fried chicken and the vegetables, this, that, and the other. But the kids' table, they always gave us hot dogs and chips and a hug. And we would sit there, like seven or eight years old, and we were like, you know, we're tired of hot dogs. We want to eat like the adults. And so um, we started a group of, of young people. We started collecting our candy money because we had a corner store I don't know how it is where you all are, but in the East Coast, we got corner stores or bodegas. And uh, in between service, we would go to the bodegas and the corner stores and we would buy our chips and drinks. So instead of buying chips and drinks, it was laid upon my heart to ask all the young people not to buy any more candy. Let's pull our money together and let's have our own youth service. And we're gonna raise this offer so that we can have our own food. We're gonna buy some pizza. <laughs> And so, I mean, it was crazy, but, um, you know, that was my first int first introduction into leadership and my pastor, although there were some people who were kind of side eyeing that, like, what are these kids doing? Um, my pastor actually got in front of the church, called me up in front of the church and said, you know, this young lady right here, there's leadership in her. And although, you know, the young people are, are trying to raise their own money for food, y'all keep your money. We'll take care of y'all. We'll make sure y'all get some food. But the whole point was she brought me up in front of the church and she said, there is leadership in her. She's going to be doing something. And she prayed for me in front of the church. And from that moment forward, 
the leadership roles that I had began to grow um, in church. Now, it's, as, as I was stating earlier, you know, I was, I was talking with one of my friends earlier and, and sometimes when I share with people that, hey, I started leading in my church, leading young people at the age of eight, they'll, they'll say, wow, you know, that, that's amazing. But I was in a community, a faith community um, that had a lot of young leaders. It seemed as though everyone uh, all the churches that we fellowship with, not just PAW churches, but sister apostolic organizations, all of my peers, many of my peers that I grew up with, we all started leading in the church at a young age. It was, it was a very positive environment, very motivating environment that allowed us uh, to kind of charge each other. It was positive peer pressure on the other, basically positive peer pressure that caused us all to lead. And so it was nothing to see a 10 year old minister of music. It was nothing to see someone eight years old teaching Sunday school. That was the norm for my peer group that I was growing up with. Um, and, and one of the things that we were laughing about was not only did uh, were we leading, but many of us got saved at young ages, five years old, six years old, seven, eight, nine, and 10. That was the norm um, to the point where if you were hitting your teenage years and you still weren't saved, people looked at you like you were crazy. You know, you're, you're, they would come to you and say, hey, you ain't get the Holy Ghost yet, baby. And you're like, I'm six years old. <laughs> but that was the norm. That was the challenge. And so, you know, um, when I look at the young people for, for today, it seems as though a lot of people, a lot of parents or people who are rearing children feel like they don't want to pressure them into the church world, but I'm a living witness that there is a delicate balance where you are able to, yes, have a fruitful and successful childhood in church and still be able to have a successful life outside of the church. I share with people often that I was blessed to have a very happy childhood in church. I didn't have the experience that, you know, some of my closest friends, some of my closest peers had nightmare experiences in church. They experienced what we all talk about as church hurt. That was not my testimony. I had a wonderful childhood, a very happy childhood in church, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I believe that that was intentional on the part of my mother. My mother, uh, Suffragan Bishop Brenda Cuthbertson. Uh, let me tell you something about Bishop Cuthbertson. So she is one out of eight children. She's one out of eight children. And at a very young age, when she was about three or four years old, she started staying with her grandmother pretty much all summer long. And they formed a bond. And right before she was about to start kindergarten, the Lord spoke to my grandmother or to my great grandmother, her grandmother, and said uh, to, act, to ask her parents if she could stay with them full time. And her parents allowed her to. No one knew that in about five years from that moment that she would lose her mother. She lost her mother at the age of 10 years old. She was raised by her grandmother. Out of all of the eight children, my mother is the only one that is saved. I believe that God handpicked my mother because he knew that there was a seed in her named Frida Morrison. I look at um, some of my cousins, my aunts and my uncles, uh, some of them are dealing with substance abuse issues. Some of them are dealing with mental health issues, schizophrenia specifically. And I know had it not been for Jesus, had it not been for God, that there's a possibility that I may have been out there as well, struggling and trying to get through this life. But God spoke to Pastor Campbell and told her to ask her, her children, can my granddaughter stay with me? And I believe that God allowed her to do that because he knew that there was a legacy that was in her, myself, as well as my children. And so it's not by mistake. I, I share that because it's an important part of my journey. It, it, helped, it helped me with my identity in Christ, as well as being just a woman in ministry. Those examples, Pastor Campbell, as well as my mother, Suffragan Bishop Cuthbertson, they showed me uh, through example and through their lifestyles how to lead with grace, how to be able to um, 
walk into a room as a woman in the church and and still be able to get your point across without being so aggressive that it turns people off. I learned through their example that I can be a leader in Christ, that I can be a leader in the church and that no matter what people may think or what people may say, if God has called me for a purpose, he's given me all of the tools, resources, energy, he's given me the Holy Ghost to be able to accomplish whatever he places before me. And so their strength, their example, their encouragement are the reasons that I'm able to stand here today and be the woman that I am. I had great examples just within my family. I also had wonderful examples that I had the opportunity to grow up around. And so um, getting back to my mother, my mother made sure that we were active in church and she made sure that our experience, uh, me and my sister, I only have one sister, she made sure that our experience in church was a positive experience. As babies, she would always bring instruments with us. So from, from toddlerhood, we were playing a tambourine, we had recorders, we were doing everything. She taught us to be active and church was a fun experience for us. So being active came naturally because it was something that was ingrained in us. It was natural to us. And so as I grew, as I stated, I started in leadership when I was eight years old. By the time I was nine and 10, I was directing not just the children's choir, but I was directing the adult choir at the church. Um, I'm musically gifted. I play the piano. I play the bass. I play the drums. The drums were my first instrument. I started playing the drums for my church when I was four years old. So I was playing all of these instruments in the church, playing it all by ear, started taking formal lessons for violin and viola, which are other instruments that I play as well. And I use those talents, uh, those gifts that God has given me in the household of faith. So by the time I hit my teenage years, I was doing a lot. I was very active in the ministry, very active in the music ministry, but very staunch in my resolve not to ever become a preacher. Not because I did not um, like preaching or had something against preachers, but I think because I came from a ministry family and people expected that to happen, when, I, when people would come to me and say, are you gonna preach like your, your mother? Are you gonna preach? You know, your father's a preacher. My father's a preacher as well. You're gonna preach like your father? And my answer, you know, I'm 10, 11, 12 years old, no. No, absolutely not. Well, as we all can see, God definitely had the last laugh. <laughs> he definitely had the last laugh. The first time that I, the Lord began to deal with me about moving into the preaching ministry, I was a teenager. I was about 15 or 16 years old when I accepted my call to the ministry. And, and when I accepted my call, honestly, I... I just said, I hear you, God. But I, I didn't want to move any, any much further than that because the truth of the matter is, even though you all see me, I'm speaking in front of people all the time, but I'm an introvert by nature. I like to be in the background. I, it's, not, you know, it's not that I'm shy. I'm more of a bashful person. Um, but I just, I'm an introvert by nature. That's me. So the idea of standing up in front of people and, and preaching and declaring the word of the Lord was just something that was overwhelming. Not that I did not enjoy the word of God. I always loved the word of God. I grew up, you know, going as again, pew baby. So I, I had to go to Sunday school and, you know, I was one of those pupils. Any time they gave us the key text, I could recite it like that, you know? And so I had a great love for the word of God, but when it came to declaring the word of God in front of people, that was something that was very overwhelming to me. It would be another 10 years before I preached my initial sermon. I was 25 when I preached my initial sermon. And I believe that God, because he knew me and he knew my heart, he gave me time to catch up with his will. He told me when I was 16, 
or when I was 15, rather. I didn't accept my call till I was 16, but he allowed me time to deal with the call. And it got to a point, by the time I had my initial sermon, I was literally running, running in the spirit to actually preach. It was like, to me, it was like, God was like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some time. I'm gonna give you some time to get yourself together. Uh, when the time is right, it's gonna be just like Jeremiah, like fire, shut up in your bone. And that's exactly what happened to me. It got to a point where I was loving Jesus. I was serving. I was happy being the choir director. That's all I wanted to do. I love singing on the choir. And the Lord allowed me to sing uh, with various Grammy award-winning gospel artists. And I was traveling the country and traveling the world. And I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. And God got me to a point where he, I had to realize it was going to be more than that. You're going to be more than a choir director. Directing the choir is great. Writing songs is great. I was blessed to, to write songs that were sung on uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes, the Powder's House album. I have a couple of songs on, on Woman Thou Art Loose. And I thought this was going to be it. I was going to be a songwriter. I was going to be in the gospel music industry. And God said, that's good, but that's not it. And as I began to seek God for songs and I began to seek God for music, God was putting word in me a word that actually caught on fire to the point where I had to go back to my pastor and say, pastor, I'm ready. I've, I've run long enough. I've ran long enough. So by the time I was 25, that was the time when I preached my initial sermon. In the meantime, going back to my teenage years, when I was 15 years old, again, I, not only was I active on the church level, but I began to become active on the state level with our council, the Greater Pennsylvania State Council. And our diocesan bishop at that time, uh, Bishop Ronald L. Young, saw the leadership in me, just like Pastor Campbell, just like my parents, saw leadership me, in me. And at the age of 15, he appointed me as the uh, vice president, I'm about to say assistant director, vice president of the Eastern Pennsylvania Regional Young People. I started out in that role when I was 15. And by the time I was 17, I was president of the Eastern Regional. And then at that point on the council level, again, I was the choir director, directing the state choir. And I think it was about 2021, 20, the youth president, our state president at that time had to resign uh, due to some work conflicts. It, she just wasn't able to get to the council and just felt like it was too much. And so, our diocesan bishop appointed me as president. I served out her last year. After serving that year, they elected me as the state president for Pennsylvania, and I served two consecutive terms. After that, after I finished that term, I got active in, on the IPYPU level, started working with the teens. And as soon as I came out of office as being a state president, I was elected as secretary. After secretary, served my term, and then I was nominated and elected as vice president. And then after serving that, I was nominated and elected as president. I'm saying all that to say this. I have cons consistently and consecutively been in youth leadership ministry without a break since I was 15 years old. From the state council all the way up to IPYPU. And it's nothing but the grace of God. And I give him all the glory because when I go back to my 15 year old self, the plans that 15 year old Frida had was just to be a choir director. But the plans that God had for me was so much greater. And how many times do we limit ourselves and limit our calls because we can't see past what we can see. We have to allow ourselves to be flexible enough, to be open enough, and to be transparent enough so that God can speak to us and use us and allow us to be able to see just how much he has in store for us. There's a song that I used to love hearing from the Thompson Community Singers, and it said, as I look, through my, as I look at myself through God's eyes, what do you see? 
When you look at yourself through God's eyes, what do you see? You should see greatness. You should see someone who's fearless. You should see a woman who is strong. You should see a, a woman who is powerful. You should see a woman who is full of faith, who has the ability, who has a strong prayer life, who has the ability to lay hands on the sick, who has the ability to heal people with a hug, who has the ability to speak to someone the words of wisdom and the words of life that'll cause them to say, I want what you have. That's the kind of life that God wants us to have. That's what he sees in you. And, and I think my biggest testimony outside of just, you know, this journey to becoming the IPYPU president, it's been a long journey, but it's been, you know, a very eye-opening journey for me because, you know, I'm the type of person, again, I'm an introvert by nature. I, I, I have the habit of limiting, limiting myself and God is always pushing and opening doors that, you know, cause I'm, I'm, I'm like this, it has to be God. That's, that's the way that I am when it comes to everything. If I'm going to make a move, it has to be God. If I'm going to step into a role, it has to be God because I've seen as again, again, like I said, I'm a pew baby. I've seen so much. I've seen people, you know, get into ministry, not so much saying that they didn't have a heart for it, but their ambitions for themselves and for their name superseded what they were supposed to do when it came to God. And I never wanted to be that person. And so to a fault, I would always limit myself because I didn't want to be that person. But God had to show me as I grew and mature in him that whatever he has for me is for me and that I don't have to hold myself back. If he opens the door, you walk through it. Every leadership role that I've had, as I stated, I have been in a, in a consecutive youth ministry leadership role within the organization since I was 50, 15 years old. Every role that I've had, I never, I never, asked anybody to nominate me for anything. I have never played politics games. I never told anyone, put my name on the, on the roll. I wanted to have that testimony that if it happened, when as, as I grew in ministry and grew in leadership roles and it became kind of evident that there's a possibility that this young lady may have the potential to be president of the IPYPU. I'm like, God, if it's you, prove it to me. I'm not gonna say anything to anybody. I'm just gonna do my work. And my testimony as it relates to this role as IPYPU president is that I allowed my work to speak for me. God spoke through me through the work that I did. I didn't have to ask anybody. I didn't have to, you know, politic my way up to the top, but God did it. Growing up in a Pentecostal Assemblies of the world, and I know that, you know, it's not about organization, but I'm so grateful to be a part of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the world. I think it's just one of the greatest apostolic organizations. And growing up in this community has been such a blessing. And I, I had parents who were active in not only their local church and not only the council, but active in the organization as well. And so they brought us as children to the convention. And so growing up in the PAW and, and seeing people like, you know, Bishop Thomas Weeks and, and Bishop, Bishop Tillman and, and Dr. Iona Locke and you know, Bishop Ellis and Elder David, like all these people that I grew up looking at as, as a kid, as a PAW kid, you know, seeing that, seeing these individuals, you know, coming up as a child, these were my, these were my church celebrities, you know, these were the people 
that I look to it, you know, my friends, they had Michael Jordan, they had, they had Michael Jackson, they had all of these people coming up, but, and I had those, you know, I had secular, you know, people that I looked up to as well, but I also had church celebrities that I looked to, and I'm calling them, I'm not saying that they, I want to make sure nobody misconstrues what I, what I'm saying, I'm not saying that they acted like celebrities, I'm saying to me as a young person, I would look up and, and see these wonderful men and women of God ministering and leading the IPYPU. And so for me to be in this role as the first female president, when I tell you that I am honored, I'm not just saying that for, for you know, you know, just nice, pretty words. I am a hundred percent honored because when it comes to women within the PAW, we have a strong, powerful legacy of women in ministry in the PAW who had every right, in my opinion, to be presiding bishops, but because of, you know, we won't go too far in that, on that, but because of, you know, the attitudes and, and really, you know, because of our humanity, Mm -hmm. They weren't able to really see some of these powerful women outside of being a missionary That's or outside of being an evangelist or outside of being a pastor. Mm -hmm. But now here we are in 2022. God has opened the door. We're now seeing our women, our PAW women being recognized mm -hmm. for the work that they are doing. We have women bishops yes. in the PAW, powerful women of God. And now we have the first female president of the IPYPU. I don't take it for granted. I stand on great shoulders and I know that it's nothing and no one but the precious, precious, precious glory of God that has allowed me to get to this place. I'm sorry, y'all. I had my timer on to All make right, sure I didn't yes, go over. <laughs> but I'm so honored. You know, next year, 2023, if the Lord... Uh, has his way, the IPYPU will be turning 90 years old. Mm. And I'm just so grateful that I get to be a part of that history. I'm yes. the 20th IPYPU president and the first female president. And it's all to the glory and honor of God. I hope and pray that someone was inspired by my testimony. You know, as, as a young person, I can say again, I, I see some people on here, you may have children, you may have grandchildren. Don't give up on your children. Don't give up on your children. They see what you're doing. They see you when you're praying in the midnight hour. Don't give up on them. Bring them to church. Let them have uh, their own personal experience. Yes, I have a, a legacy of family members. Like I said, I'm fifth generation apostolic, but I had to learn how to love God on my own. That's right. I couldn't rely on my mother's salvation. Mm -hmm. Couldn't rely on my father's salvation. I had to learn Jesus all on my own. And he revealed himself to me. And because of that, that's why I am standing here today. I have my own testimony. Mm -hmm. I'm able to stand with my mother, with my grandmother, with my grandparents, with my father, and say that I know and love Jesus. So that's it. Thank you. Amen. Come on. We just ask that everybody unmute your line and just give the Lord a hand praise for Evangelist Morrison, this awesome testimony. She was just unmute your line. Let's give the Lord a hand praise for what we heard so far. Oh, my God. You got quite a bit of um, comments in the chat that are saying beautiful legacy and amazing and awesome young woman of God. Loving her representation and demonstration of the Lord Jesus Christ working and being seen through you. It's so wonderful to hear your testimony and many people are saying thanks. And we're going to open up the floor for dialogue right now. Uh, oh my God, it's just so much to unpack. <laughs> Amen. Doing our testimony is just awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for the example that you are. And thank the Lord for your parents and even those that have um, brought you up through even with the legacy of being the fifth generation apostolic uh, in your family. That's awesome. Uh, we're going to open for a dialogue at this time. 
And we know yet there's quite a bit of people out here that know you and know you personally that may have something to say. So we open the floor for dialogue. Amen, amen. Anybody? Or did they put it all in the chat? <laughs> amen, amen, amen. I know with, with your um uh, with your mom being uh being bishop, uh suffragan bishop, yes. and that, that speaks volumes right there with your mom being suffragan bishop and uh and even with you being the first uh president. I always think about, I think I heard uh evangelist our pastor. Uh, Sandra Riley give her testimony of how she came up through the ranks and the main I think she became was it vice president but that's yes, as far as she went mm -hmm. but she gave homage to you being the first female president I mean and she just really gave homage to you doing that uh, presentation and interview that she had and I uh, was just so inspirational so just you know, I know that you're very inspirational to even those that are coming up, let them know they can do it. You know, you can achieve anything you want to achieve. Amen. I love it. Absolutely. Your testimony of putting God first in everything. I think Evangelist Dunlap, uh, Carolyn Dunlap, I think she had a, did she have your, yes, sir. she was un, unmuted. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I did. Yes, I did. I did. Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> That is okay. That is all right. I'm, I'm just going to be real quick. My heart is just rejoicing. I'm just so elated. This this powerful young woman of God. I tell you, I could have turned flips if Evangelist Williams was on here. She, she'll tell you all about that service we went to and this guy was turning flips in the service. <laughs> and she never got over that. I felt like doing that myself. When we, I tell you, if I could have gone out and brought, brought truckloads in to vote, but you know, God didn't even need that. Like she said, she didn't play politics. God knew what he was doing. And I was just so happy, just happy to serve under her. Just so happy about the things that, that have been accomplished even during this pandemic, how forward thinking she was. And um, Madam President, that, that's, that's, what, that's how they address her, Madam President. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I love it, love it, love it. And like you said, she crosses organization lines. I mean, Lord is God is just using her even during this pandemic. I got a chance to even hear her uh, speak for the or, uh, the organization that I grew up in, PCS yes. with uh, Bishop Gates. Oh my God, I uh, that that was amazing, amazing, amazing. But God has just and is still using her mightily, and even. Um, which was close to my heart was Christian education at PYPU Christian education, how, how progressive during this pandemic that they have been all under her leadership, you know, uh, uh, sister Pat height. And I mean, and yeah. they, they went forward and, and it's such a testament to Madame president, because a lot of times, even though, you, you may be in that position following their leadership. If they don't grab the vision that God has given you, then you won't be able to go forward. So she didn't just sit back and just say, no, y'all wait, we're not going to do this. We in a pandemic. We blah, blah, blah. No, she jumped on board. She listened to the ideas. She saw and heard the vision. She was in agreement, touching and agree. Madam president. <laughs> <laughs> and just went forward. And I mean, that, that, and that's just that little part right there that I had anything to do with. Everything else, I know she just went forward and she served with such humility, like she said, coming up through the ranks, even as the, the secretary, you know, we had to go through, uh, <laughs> we had been, been in the position I was in, we had to go through so many people to get stuff done. But she would just push my stuff forward. I would be, I'd be poor little pitiful. Me, I'm, I'm trying to get the flyers <laughs> approved. I'm trying to get the president to go on and say it's okay, get it out there online. And, and she would just push that thing forward and so that we could do what we had to do. And she didn't stop when she became the president. The platform that she ran on, she kept her promises through the help of the Lord. And you know, it ain't nothing like strong black women. And it sure enough ain't nothing like strong black apostolic women. I mean, Amen. God be doing some stuff. 
And I just appreciate how God has used her. I'm just going to stop right here, but I'm just uh, like Sister Lena Bell used to sing, bubbling, bubbling, bubbling. It's a bubbling mm -hmm. over in my heart. <laughs> she would get up and say that and tear the church up. <laughs> so it's just a bubbling. I'm so enjoy. I'm so proud of you. You've done so so well, and I just hope that if it's in if it's in the will of the Lord for for another term, we got your back, baby. We right there. We gonna if we gonna vote if we have to fly up there and fly right back. We have to ask God, make it visible, honey. We 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 gonna be doing everything we can if it's God's will for it to happen another term, particularly if God feels like we have learned what we need to learn during this pandemic, pandemic. and he's yes. ready for us to be in these in-person services. We want to be right there. We want to support in person to let you know just how much we appreciate you allowing God to use you. And you didn't have to, to go into the belly of the whale when he called you. He, <laughs> he didn't have to have that, Joe, that Jonah experience. <laughs> But he, he knew when it was time for you to say, yes, Lord. And that's what you mm -hmm. did. So we just, woo, girl, we appreciate you so much. I'm like them, them folk uh, back in the day, they would say, they would just say, I, I, I'm just going to sit down. Just take the mic from me. I'm just going to sit down. I'm just going <laughs> to I'm just going to mute myself. <laughs> but girl, we love you. We love you. We appreciate you. Thank you, Evangelist Dunlap. I love you too. God bless you. Amen, amen. Define the eyes, honey. She's putting things, pushing things on through. And she said, that no, ain't no stopping right now, honey. We're going to push this thing on through. Amen. Someone else? Comments, questions? Amen. You see, I'm sure you're seeing the, um, the comments that they're putting in the chat. Anybody else? I know some people are, uh, as far as the um, young young people are, are, especially young women that are coming up now. Uh, when you were saying how you they recognize leadership in you at a young age, and uh, you had that fire in you even as a you know in your young age that continue to grow, and that's why I tell people a lot of times uh, flourish where you are in that season. Because mm -hmm. as you go through the journey of life, your seasons would your your seasons it changes seasons, but God will shift you into a different place, different positions, different responsibilities, different assignments, and uh, and like you said, you recognize it. But I, I love what you said how the Lord allowed you time to and and to catch up with where He will have you be, you know, uh, just just that time that he allowed that. And I think sometimes we need that just to accept it because some responsibilities are so uh, heavy. They're mm -hmm. very heavy. And so when we uh, look ahead, especially those, especially your family that have served as pastors and uh, in that particular type of leadership role, even in preaching and teaching the word of God, it's a heavy call. And uh, so I know you saw them and recognized uh, how they went through uh, you know, in that particular area of ministry and developing and coming up, you know, even the challenges and some of the struggles and even then the triumphs that they had during that time. Uh, is there anything in particular that you want to tell the person, uh, someone that might be struggling right now with uh, really totally accepting the will of God, those that may not have enough confidence in what God has called them to do during this season? I would say, you know, whatever, whatever you're dealing with, allow God to speak to you. And the, and the thing is, because God is always speaking. He's all, and he's already spoken. Yes. But we have to allow ourselves to be in a position to hear. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I talk about my happy childhood in church, but the thing of it is, I talk about that because the truth of the matter is, as I moved into adulthood, my early adulthood in church was traumatic. <laughs> it was traumatic because there was, it, you know, you're coming, you're coming into womanhood, you know, there were so many things that I was dealing with. And 
I call I call like my late teens into my early 20s, like my my crisis of faith time. Not so much that I I didn't believe God or I was like I, I I've never been out of the church, but I just had a moment where I was struggling with trying to figure out what it is that I'm supposed to do. What is it that I believe? And I and during that time, you know, like I said, I was always active. I was still directing the choir, still doing youth, youth leadership, but I, I needed to know for myself why. And and that struggle that I was that I was having was was the time when I began to just say, God, what is it that you want me to do? And he spoke to me during that time. And what I can say is this, because of that period where, as I, like I said, I coined it as my crisis of faith, because of that period, that was the time when, yes, I knew the word. Yes, I, was, I grew up in Sunday school and can quote the scriptures back to back, but it was during that time when those same scriptures came alive to me. It wasn't just words to quote but to actually know that God is my refuge mm-hmm. and strength, a present help in a time. Like I began to experience the word coming alive and that's what made my faith resolve. And I started to even study things like, you know, why do we baptize in Jesus name? Why do we, like I started to, not so much that I was questioning it, but I wanted to know that I know mm-hmm. these things so much so that my resolve is straight. Like I'm, I'm not, there's no switching. You're not going to see, oh, you know, she lost the faith and now she's Buddhist. That ain't going to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm in Jesus. Wow, but... <laughs> I'm staying with the Lord. You know, but but because it's because of that season, that foundation yes. that I found, you know, I already had that foundation in childhood, but that that additional foundation that I had during that faith crisis time when it was just me and Jesus and me trying to figure out all right, Lord, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to be? You know, it was during that time when the word of God began began to come alive to me and began to become real to me. And I began to develop my own testimony. And it was a couple of years after that when I finally had my initial sermon when I began to preach. Uh, But it took that period. It took that period. And I honestly believe that had I not had a good experience Mm-hmm. As a young person and child, it's very possible that I may not be in church right now. Mm. I believe it was meant for me. We all have our varying experiences. There's yes. some people who had terrible childhoods in church, but they're they're thriving as adults now. And then there are people who had, they may have had a good experience in church's childhood, but then they got old and things started happening. But I'm grateful that the foundation that I had, I was able to experience God in a very real way as a child so that when I got old and trouble came and, you know, all of these changes and transitions and all of these things started happening to me as I began to come out of my teenagehood into, into the twenties, I was able to have something to hold on to Mm -hmm. so that no matter how people were treating me, no matter what was going on, on the outside, I still remembered that there was a God who loved me. And because of that, that sustained me through that period. That's good, that's good, that's good. And it's, it's really important to have that relationship or develop that right relationship for yourself. Cause some people, they kind of ride off of the relationship of their parents, you know, and then once it gets, you get to a certain age, it's like, so who am I? I've, I've just done this because I was told to do or I was showed to do, but not necessarily developing that relationship myself. So that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And we just thank the Lord for what he has developed in you because you've shown up a powerful woman of God. <laughs> thank you. God bless. In, in, in every aspect from administration to ministry, everything, amen, that you do is just awesome. And with the spirit of excellence, great representation with the spirit of excellence. Anyone else, questions, comments? Um, praise the Lord. And I just want to say thank you so much for that beautiful and awesome testimony. I think you kind of answered my question, but I'm going to ask uh, if you have a little more information that you want to provide to us. Um, you share the awesome, and we already know the wonderful leadership role you're playing now. 
what was the importance of, uh, was there any bearing on you being a good follower so that you could be effective in uh, being a good leader? Absolutely. You have to be a good follower mm -hmm. in order to be a good leader. And serving, I had, I had the opportunity to witness both on my mother's side and my father's side. Now this may be another, another stream, another time, but very quickly, this, my story is this, my parents were both active in ministry when they got married. Um, and the Lord, my father's testimony is the Lord told him that when they got married, that my mother did not have to leave her church. My father was attending another apostolic church. It was an independent apostolic church and he was a co-pastor. And my mother was basically the assistant pastor at her church. And so when they got married, they were both attending two different churches. My father is now at our church. Long story short, he's now in ministry with my mother. My father was very faithful to his pastor. He was his pastor's right-hand man. I watched his leadership. I watched him serve. I watched him be there for his pastor. I watched my mother serve her grandmother who was her pastor. So I had two great examples of people who were serving in excellence and to see how God elevated them. And then the two of them coming together, serving each other and serving the house of God having that example allowed me to serve them. Mm -hmm. As a child, it was easy to serve because I saw their example. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I believe that serving, seeing their example and then being motivated by their example to serve them is the reason why I'm able to do what I do now. I serve my pastor, my, my mother is my pastor. I serve my pastor the way that I saw her serve her pastor mm -hmm. with the spirit of excellence. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that it's very important. If you want to be a good leader, you have to be a good follower. You have to be a good follower. Mm -hmm. You have to be a good follower. And so, yeah, I can't stress that enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Amen. 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 Anybody else? We'll take one more comments, question. Amen, amen. Well, we do thank the Lord for Evangelist Morrison again for being a part of our segment tonight. It's such an honor to have you. Thank the Lord for each and every one of you that are consistent in tuning in and being a part of This Is My Story and Her Perspective. Uh, if there's anyone that's on here for the first time and you would like to receive notification of, uh, of our segments uh, as well as receive the replay, please leave your uh, email address in the chat and I will add you to our list. Please leave your email address to the chat and I will uh, you know, uh, put, add you to our list and you will be receiving our notifications. We ask that those that do go and look at the replay, those that will be looking at the replay, please hit the, the, uh, the like and the subscribe button. I'm trying to remember to say that every time. <laughs> please hit the like and subscribe button. So that even uh, if, if you're not necessarily on the list, at least if you've subscribed to the YouTube channel, uh, you can um, you know, be notified even through the YouTube channel when we do upload our videos. So we really appreciate each and every one of you all. We ask that you continue to keep us in prayer as we go forth with what the Lord will have us to do at this time. Uh, will, are there any announcements of anyone would like to make? Any announcements, any events that are coming up that you would like to make an announcement about? And then we'll turn it over to Evangelist Morrison for final remarks and closing us out in prayer. Any announcements, church announcements, our personal ministry announcements. Um, you've got businesses uh, that you're having maybe a special uh, event or anything. All right. Well, Evangelist Morrison, we ask at this time that you would close us out and final remarks and, and, and prayer at this time. Amen. Well, thank you once again for the opportunity to just share and connect and fellowship with you all today. 
Um, I certainly hope and pray that we all have the opportunity to uh, come together in person, Lord willing, you know, things are, are starting to change. And we know that uh, our presiding bishop just announced that the summer convention is coming up and it's gonna be in St. Louis, I believe August the 1st through the 6th. I plan to be there. I hope you all are as well. And so if you see me, please don't hesitate to stop and say, praise the Lord. Um, and I, I look forward to Lord willing, seeing you all as well. All right, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we thank you, O oh God, for being our Lord and our Savior and our King. We thank you, O oh God, for another opportunity that you've allowed us to come together. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love that you continuously extend toward us, O oh God. We thank you for the new mercies that we wake up to every morning. Great is your faithfulness to us. You've been faithful to us, O oh God, and we give you the glory, honor, and praise. Lord, I thank you for every woman that's on this uh, live stream today, oh God. I thank you. If there's any brothers on here, oh God, we thank you for them as well, oh God. But we thank you for this ministry uh, that has come together, oh God, to uplift and to inspire and to impart and to uh, provide inspiration to our sisters in Christ, oh God, so that we can be strong women for you, oh God, and that we may be able to share our testimonies of your goodness and your grace and how you lifted us up, oh God, and how you chose us from the foundation of the world, oh God. We ask right now in the name of Jesus that you will bless us, bless us with good health, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Bless our resources in the name of Jesus. If there's any sick among us, Lord, I ask that you heal them. Oh God, if there's anybody that's dealing with depression or things that are going on in their mind, oh God, I ask that you lift up their head and give them peace, the kind of peace that passes all understanding, oh God. Lord, I ask right now, oh God, that you bless Evangelist Morrison, oh God. We thank you for the work that you have placed in her hands, oh God, and I ask that you continue to bless her in a mighty way, oh God. You know the desires of her heart, Lord. Lord, we ask that you meet every need in the name of Jesus in her life, Lord, and to every person that's on this live stream, Lord, we ask that you bless them, meet every need in their life, for you are the God who is able to supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory, oh God. It is not about us, it's all about you. Help us to be a good example. Help us to be good leaders and good followers. Lord, help us, oh God, to be able to be bold as lions when it comes to declaring your word so that sons and daughters may be birthed in your kingdom, Lord. Allow us to be a witness, oh God, a witness on our job, a witness in our communities, a witness in our neighborhood, a witness to our unsaved loved ones, Lord. Let, we ask right now in the name of Jesus that you have your way in us and among us, oh God. And until we meet again, whether it's down here on earth or up in glory, God, we ask that you just keep us in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen and amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand praise. Amen for what we've heard tonight, her sharing. And we pray continuous blessings okay. over you, Evangelist Morrison, exceeding abundantly above all that you can ever ask or think. Thanks so much for being a part of us tonight. And we look forward to seeing everyone again next week as we continue the theme, The Remarkable Women. And we will have another guest next week that will share her story and her journey to defeating the odds as a remarkable woman. In Jesus' name, God bless you all. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>